Rockford Fosgate designed some of the most complex and difficult to repair circuits on the car audio market. This T1000 4 AD is no exception, and the fault that it presents me with in this video is harder to track down than anything that I have seen before. Can I get to the bottom of it and resurrect this $1000 amplifier? Let's find out. The repair started off like any other checking for shorted MOSFETs on the power supply and the output side. And, and this channel we have a 589. I think this is the low side. We have a 976. So let's go for this low side over here. We're reading 571. We didn't find any shorts. However, I noticed that one of the low side FETs was reading a different value between the gate and source pins to the other channels. Powering up the board showed us that three channels were working just fine and the one problematic channel was just swinging to negative DC rail. Negative rail. And if it comes on, we just get uh, a swing to negative rail. So we've got full DC, negative DC on the speaker terminal. And that's all over here on the speaker terminal as well. This is kind of interesting. This shows that there's a drive circuit fault, but it also shows that it's potentially not going to be too bad. <laughs> This was as a result of the drive circuit for this channel telling the low side FET to turn on fully as seen by a bump on the low side gate on the scope screen. Whereas here we should have a nice drive wave instead. But we should have these little pulses. This, this is what's telling the MOSFET to turn on, off, on, off, on, off like that. Flipping the board over exposed the MOSFET drivers for each channel. Uh, IRS 201. Oh, what the fuck? I haven't seen these before. IRS 20124S. That's a new one. Obsolete. Love to see it. You love to see it. Digital audio driver with discrete <laughs> d dad d d p. Dad d d p. <laughs> After checking the data sheets for them to work out which pin did what, I discovered that our bad channel was missing the pulses to the input pin 1 which were present on all the other good channels. The input signal just bumps up. See that, it's bumping up. So it's telling the driver, hey, turn the low side on fully. So I traced this pin back to see where the pulses originate from using one of the good channels as a reference and found that it comes out of one of the pins on the upright daughter boards. So we have continuity Q40, has continuity directly to one of the pins of the driver card. So what we can do is we can have a look at the other, another channel here and get the same pin and power the amp up and see whether we have the PWM on the same pin as this one. And that will tell us whether that's actually where the uh, signal for the drive circuit is originating from. So let's power this up. What's interesting though is that the pulses for the bad channel were actually coming out of the daughter board for that channel. Ah, we have signal! Okay! Ah, oh, that's a relief actually. I see why that's a relief, because I did not like the idea, I mean, it would be pretty easy, but it's nice not to necessarily have to remove this, this whole driver card and start poking around in there, so... But they weren't making their way all the way to the drive chip. Something was stopping them along the way. See there? Nice looking PWM. But it's not making its way through this little circuit here of transistors, probably some resistors, it's not making its way to our drive IC over here. I then started following the pulses through the set of transistors that were between the daughter board and the drive chip to see where it was they went missing. We go into Q41 next to it and we don't come out. This took quite a while and there was a lot of removing parts, testing, swapping parts between the good channel and the bad channel to no real avail. What do you reckon guys? Do you reckon that we're on the money? Do you reckon we are on the, on the ball with Q41 being the bad part or do you think it's something else? I can't really see how it could be anything else. How many people are actually following this uh, and understanding what I'm doing and how many people are just enjoying it for the vibes and the chat? Most of you guys are like, nope, no idea what you're doing. Just uh, enjoy watching your work and here for the vibes. <laughs> fair play, man. Fair play, guys. I appreciate that. Eventually, after quite some hours, I came across some components that were getting some incorrect voltages on them when the amplifier was powered up. Namely, here by the drive chip, VCC was leaking its way through to the VB pin. We shouldn't get negative 12 volts on the high side floating supply out of nowhere. 
VCC is pin 8, which is 12 volts above negative rail, so maybe maybe VCC is shorted to VB. Aha! Interesting. And finally, only when I removed the drive chip itself, these voltages went away, and the pulses that were actually supposed to be on the input pin 1 finally reappeared. Yeah, 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 there's PWM there at, uh, at pin 1 now. <laughs> so yeah, definitely, definitely is the chip. To confirm that the rest of the components on this channel were good, or if there were any other faults, I swapped one of the known working drive chips from the good channel and put it into the bad one. When I powered it up, there was no more swing to negative rail, but to my dismay, there was no output switching still, despite the chip being fed with the correct supply voltages and with the correct input pulses. Okay, we don't actually have anything uh, on there at all. We have PWM input, so it must just be that the chip is in shutdown. So the next thing to do was to start looking at any pins for this chip that could be telling it to shut down. Pin 3 was actually shut down and dead time, and pin 5 was over current. Both of these would be able to prevent the chip from working if the wrong voltage was on them. On the three other good channels, pin 3 would start at negative rail and then bump up by about 12 volts to tell the chip to activate. Now this wasn't happening on our bad channel, it was staying down at negative rail, essentially telling the chip to stay shut down. Okay, we have negative rail, so that is in shutdown. Yeah, nothing. It, it doesn't come out of shutdown. So maybe some other fault then with the shutdown. Why, why, why is it not coming out of shutdown? Now this is where things started getting really deep and complicated with this repair. I started tracing back where the shutdown pin originates from and found that after going through some resistors and transistors, it comes from another pin on this daughter board. It might go to the driver card itself, hey? Yeah, it does. It goes to the driver card. Oh shit, so we might actually have an issue on the driver card in the end. So that's there. Yeah, that goes off to the driver card. Okay, shit. So it looks like something on the driver card itself might have actually failed. So it was time to remove the daughter board. Oh yeah, that's coming out like a freaking ice cream, bruv. Ta-da! I wanna know, I wanna know. I want to know what everyone had for dinner. Right, we've got, we got a lot of different people here from a lot of different cultures, a lot of different countries, backgrounds, etc., different ages. What did y'all have for dinner? They even just ate a cheese sandwich. What, like just cheese? So like bread, butter, cheese, butter, bread, cheese sandwich. While the card was out, it was a good idea to run the multimeter across all the transistors, diodes, semiconductor parts to see if we could find any obvious shorted components that shouldn't be showing a short across them, um, but we didn't find anything like that. And just to rule out anything on the actual main board being an issue once and for all, I decided to swap one of the good daughter boards into the bad channel location. So now that that's in, I should be able to power this up and uh, we should have on the what was originally the bad channel but we should have pin 3 we should have that going up to activation we should have some VC some some voltage coming up on pin 3 um, to take the chip out of shutdown once I had swapped the good card into the bad channel the correct shutdown signals now appeared on the bad channel hey there we go okay the issue is on the card it is on here the issue is on the card. So this absolutely confirms that the issue is on the daughter board itself for our original bad channel. Due to how close these boards are mounted and the fact that they're double sided, it's impossible to do any tracing or soldering or work with them while they're mounted in the board. So in order to follow the shutdown signal any further with the oscilloscope, I needed to install some headers to connect the daughter board away from the main board while still being connected. This also freed up quite a big gap in enough to carefully probe the other boards that were left in there to compare the voltages between the good and the bad. What I discovered was that the shutdown signal branches off in so many directions on these daughter boards and it's affected and influenced by so many different parts on here. This in turn led to hours and hours hours of following, tracing, comparing, removing and testing parts between good board and bad board. There were a lot of false flags that gave me the impression that I'd found some faulty component only to be proven wrong when testing it out the board or by swapping it for the same component from one of the good cards. There were even moments where it looked like a bad solder joint was the cause or a broken trace. It's either that we had a poor solder connection on R16 and R9 
or D5 is kind of on its way out. Or the issue fixed itself by heating up the board with the hot air gun and so on. Babies, try to heat up the failed driver board slightly if it's a bad connection, uh, could be for a short period of time. Disappear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's my thinking as well. Uh, I think it's more likely that it was a bad solder connection on one of these resistors. None of which actually led me down a path to the root issue, wasting many hours in the process. I think what I'm gonna do, maybe, is, maybe I'm gonna... And I even ended up soldering the board back into the main board, believing it to be some poor connection issue on the headers or pins, which obviously did nothing. So, what happens when we power it up? It's in protect. Fuck you. I don't know, man. Fuck. I actually started to wonder if I had solved the original issue, but due to there not being an output drive IC in the main board, it was kind of looking like there was still an issue. Um, this wasn't the case if I'd have thought about it properly, but in my mental state, I was like, nah, maybe this is the issue. So after waiting a long time for a sketchy and possibly fake replacement drive chip from AliExpress to arrive, because these are no longer available anywhere to buy apart from China, I fitted this new chip from AliExpress to the channel that now had the bad daughter board on it. With the new drive chip fitted, the problem was still the same, of course. Okay, so we have all channels operational apart from our problem channel, which is, as expected, that's what we were seeing prior to fitting the chip. At this point, I had reminded myself that I knew for sure that the, there was an actual component problem issue on the daughter board itself. I removed both the bad daughter board and one of the good daughter boards and did some more comparing, not really finding anything different on the multimeter. Then I connected both of these boards to my bipolar bench power supply, only giving the cards their supply voltages to see if there were any differences or leaking voltages on the bad card when just giving them their raw supply voltages and nothing else. So hopefully this doesn't smoke out. Three, two, one. Unfortunately for me, both cards behaved exactly the same when only fed with their plus and minus supply voltages. So I turned my attention back to the main board and started connecting up only what I deemed to be the important pins to try and get them to behave how they were when they were mounted in the board. The goal here was to have both boards powered up off of the main board so I could probe them both at the same time and compare voltages at different points on the board while, while the bad one was displaying the fault. So we have negative 2.5, which is actually kind of the same as, as what we had when we had it in the... Um, so I think we might need the clock signal injection. We might actually even need to connect up some of the remaining pins for the, um, the low side rail and stuff like that as well, which is kind of annoying. In the end, I discovered that the cards simply needed too many of their pins connected to actually display the fault to me, so I decided just to refit my original headers and just swap the cards over between the headers and note down the voltages at different points in a notepad for each card. And actually, I'm going to take some voltage readings first, I think, from around here. So, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for parts of the circuit that change when the activation signal comes in, right? The first comparisons I wanted to make between the good and bad daughter boards were between some of the other output pins that we hadn't checked yet. It was over here that I noticed some differences in voltages between these two cards that I hadn't seen before. Ah, interesting. On this card, this one gives me 9.6 volts. That's interesting. I haven't got that written down on for the bad card. We should have 9.5 to 9.7 volts, which is not present. Okay. I started the painful process of tracing back from these pins through the circuit, seeing where these differences in voltage between the two cards originate from. And along the way, I found an absolute mess of completely different readings at various diodes, transistors, and op amps. Righto. Okay. Now we're starting to see some actual legitimate hard evidence of differences between these cards two is nothing on the bad board it should be three down to about 2.6 um, and on pins six and seven we should have 
zero, but we actually have 1.3 and negative 9.9. .9. So quite vast differences there between these two boards. When I got to the op amps, due to how much the signals branch off from how many pins there are connected here, it made most sense to simply remove these op amps completely and see whether the voltages on the now empty pads where they were are the same between the cards or if they're still different, meaning that the problem would be further down the circuit. We had zero, but we should have 9.7. So we still have zero, the amp's still going into protect, and on pin two we should have three volts and, and sinking down. Right, okay. Okay, let's remove the um, 072C. The thing is that one tiny bad component deep into the circuit can cause such a butterfly effect that so many different voltages end up being completely messed up further down the circuit, it can be really difficult to locate the origin. I removed an LM833 and a TL072C and found that even with these parts removed, the voltages on their empty pads for them was still completely different between these two boards. Okay, pin four we don't need to worry about. Pin five, we're looking for a negative 5.5. Ah, okay, that's different. That is different. Hmm, okay. So further down the rabbit hole I went. An interesting thing I found though was that by removing these two op amps, the bad daughter board was now actually sending the correct shutdown and enable signals to the drive chip, and the channel actually started oscillating and producing audio. No protection mode yet. Ah, it actually comes to life, holy shit. So without the 072C there, this actually operates perfectly as intended. We have output switching. This was a relief because uh, we now know the actual foundation of the shutdown circuit was working correctly, but some bad part that lies deeper in the circuit after the op amps on this board is causing it to remain in shutdown mode. Tracing further on from these now removed op amps led us to some more op amps to the right of the board. Is that what goose chase? So we need to go ahead and remove, see this one here, U, what's that, U11, U11. We've got to remove U11. <laughs> so, one of those LM833s got removed as well. Um, the voltage differences still persisted even on these empty pads for this op amp. Holy shit, they're all fucking completely different. Negative 13.7. What the hell is going on? How many? There is so much difference here. Look, look at the differences. So this is the good one and this is the bad one. Where's all this nonsense voltage is coming from? So we continued from here all the way to the other side of the board through some more transistors, diodes and resistors that were all reading different voltages again, eventually, finally winding up at some absolutely tiny six pin chips. I'm a bit worried because we're getting dangerously close to these tiny little um, eight, uh, six leg ICs. I'm really hoping that these aren't bad because I've no idea what they are and it means we're gonna need to order some new parts. Uh, I think this is, no, they're freaking different guys. I think these are the problem, whatever the heck these little things are. Oh man, it's just labeled 4F. And uh, then on this one up here, 2F. Oh, they're fucking different as well. <laughs> of course they're different. So we've got 17.49, 32, negative 39. So now we have a reference for the good one. Let's go ahead and plug the bad one in, just see what we have. Uh, I'm, you know, we, we, we know that they're gonna be different. So I think it, it might just be a good idea to go ahead and remove these. So that's actually kind of the same. So we, we've got some, we've got, like these are looking kind of similar-ish. Only the only real main differences between these two, right, is we've got pin three and pin six uh, are the main ones that are different there. Again, pin three and pin six are the main ones that are different there. Since I had voltage differences on these six pin chips as well, it was time to remove them, same as the op amps. So we're hoping to see the same. Why, right, well, guys, what's it gonna be? <laughs> Oh my god, what's it gonna be? Right, let's power it up. Finally, after so many hours of tracing, removing these tiny chips, these six pins, gave me complete equilibrium between these two cards. There were no more voltage differences between these two cards anywhere. 17, oh my god, that's what it is. Okay, so. The boards now are behaving the same. We've removed enough components that the boards are now acting the same. So, in my excitement, I wanted to put the little chips from the good board onto the bad board to see if all the voltage readings that I'd been noting down that were taken from the good board now changed and appeared on the bad board, solidifying my belief that we had finally found these to be the root of the issue. And I want to see if the bad board becomes the good board. These values here were the original bad board readings, yeah? We should 
now hopefully have these voltage readings from the good board now appear on our bad board if those chips are the issue. Okay, moment of truth then. Minus seven. 17. Yes! Fucking yes! Okay. Yes, that is now the readings that were on the good board are now on the bad board after swapping those, those chips around. Right, as I'm sure you can tell, that felt good. Now, let me pass you on from voiceover beverage to current day beverage, and we'll see whether we have finally been able to solve this absolute monster of a failure. So after a little bit of digging around online, I was actually able to find out exactly what parts these are. And yes, they are actually um, dual transistors, bipolar transistors we've got here. One of them is a, um, a dual NPN and one of them is a dual PNP. Uh, the part numbers for these are NST45011 and 45010. So yeah, they're basically complementary uh, to each other. Um, so we've got these on the bench right here. Came in the post literally today. So we're just gonna drop those in to the, now we're gonna put these ones into the original good board, which was this one. The ones from the original good board are in the original bad board, which is now, as we saw, starting to behave. The voltages are starting to go in the right places. Then we're gonna start building both of these boards back up with the LM833s and the 072Cs and everything else like that. I imagine that the 072Cs and the LM833s are probably fine, but we'll find out. We know that at least one set of 833s and 072Cs are fine because we had one fully working board. The marking is very, very faint on there. Okay, so a bit of fresh flux. Okay, let that cool down a little bit. Now what we need to do then is on both of these boards, we are missing a bunch of these op amps. Um, I'm just gonna check to see that they read roughly the same between some random pins here, just to see whether we have either of them that are obviously failed. 700, just a really crude way of like figuring out just whether there's any clear obvious faults with either, either of these. So these are both reading identical. It's unlikely that you'd have two op amps that fail in such the exact same way that they're leaking the exact same value. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, suspect that these are absolutely fine. So now let's put U4 and U8 back on. And we've got all of those op amps here from both of those cards, the 072Cs and the LM833s. Yep, similar enough. Over here we've got the 720. Yeah. Yeah, these are all reading exactly the same as each other, which says to me that there's not like there's any problems there. So let's go ahead and flux this card up. Okay, now I'm not doing any tests in between this. I'm just I wanna just load these boards back up just because I'm feeling somewhat relatively confident. <laughs> which could end up going badly. But I feel kind of confident. So I'm just gonna load these up with the op amps and um, just test them out in the board. I just want to see what happens. I'm gonna go from there. Okay then, ladies and gentlemen, it's a moment of truth really for me. So all of the parts of both of these boards are now uh, back soldered on. So these are now complete. Nothing is missing from these. Um, we're going to put these back into the board and hope and pray that they work as intended. So this is the original good card. So provided we haven't broken anything while we've been um, swapping parts from the good one to the bad one, this one should still work. This one didn't have a problem before, so it should still work. I'm a bit nervous now. There we go. Okay, fantastic. So now is the real test. Now is the real test. Does the bad card work? Let's remove this one. Oh man, this is nerve wracking as heck. This is the moment, guys. This is the moment. Ah, I'm so nervous. Okay, right, let's go. Oh, yes! Yeah, boy, did you see that class D switching? Did you, I know you saw that class D switching. Yes, oh my god, that deserves, that deserves a glass of wine. Cheers, guys. Oh my god, finally. That was an absolute mission, but we are not quite finished yet. There's one more thing. 
that could go wrong, that could be bad, that we haven't checked yet. Can you remember what it is? Can you think, can you think back to what it might be? So, remember the original failure of this amplifier was the drive IC in this channel failed, okay? Now, we took the drive IC from this channel and popped it in there just to make sure the rest of the channel was all good and working, and it does. The thing that we haven't tested yet is actually this brand new drive IC from AliExpress in China. <laughs> because these drivers, these IRS 20142S, I think they are, these drivers aren't available to buy anywhere, they're discontinued, they're freaking... What we do just need to confirm though is that the drive IC is legitimate and works from China. We just need to solder the uh, these driver cards back into the board, get rid of these headers at long last, and uh, yeah, get these back in the board and then test all four channels out. By the way, guys, I looked up the price of this amplifier brand new. Oh my gosh. I can think of a lot more things that I would rather spend that amount of money on than a four channel amplifier for my car. Now this, I would say this is the bigger moment of truth, I think. This is, this is the one that I'm a bit more nervous about. So I was confident, I was pretty confident that the, um, that the driver card repairs would be successful, but I'm a little unsure about what's going to happen with this AliExpress drive IC. So <laughs> let's cross our fingers and let's pray that we get some switching on this one. Oh, we do! Okay. Switching on this one. Switching on this one. Oh my god, yeah, we have switching on all four channels. Oh my gosh, that, that is the best news. I'm so happy. And especially after I saw how much this amplifier costs brand new, um, we just had to fix it. <laughs> Naturally, I've just done the classic Lewis Rossman there where we've just seen the uh, Class D switch and we've just assumed everything's absolutely hunky-dory. So, But we do need to reassemble it back into the heatsink. We do need to check for audio on all four channels, clean sine waves on all four channels. And we do need to endurance test it to make sure that this amplifier is, continues to work over a long playing period between you know 10 and 14 volts, etc. So th there's some more testing to be done, but I do believe that that is the end of this saga. Let's first of all power it up. We've got um, front left here, which is this one right here. It's looking good and sounding good. Front right. Rear left. Awesome. So yeah, that's it. Makes good clean audio on all four channels. The sine waves look great. Um, just a little bit more testing for me to do, and then that's going to be it. Back to the client. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that this one finally is off my bench, and uh, we can call it a day. It is so satisfying. This is one of the great things I love about um, amplifier repair and repairing stuff. Yes, this repair might have taken a long time. Might have taken. You know, if you were adding it up by hourly rate, um, then it's probably not worth the repair. But because I hate being beaten, I don't like giving up, and I like to see things through. Um, I've just sacrificed some of my own time here just to get this up and running for you guys as well, to see the kind of process and just kind of see one that's a little bit more complicated than your average FET gates drivers, that kind of thing. Um, this is not a generic circuit. This is a circuit that, like I say, is completely new to me, the actual uh, Class AD drive circuit. Never seen that before. We don't have a schematic for this exact driver card. So it's taught me a lot. Hopefully it's taught you some stuff as well. And hopefully it's been entertaining. Um, if you enjoyed, hit the like button and subscribe because plenty more videos like this coming soon. And I'm going to try and do some kind of audio, like subwoofer, car audio type of videos again soon uh, as well in the near future, uh, as well as just amplifier repairs. So thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.